I'd like to welcome you all to this session on how to do left bundle branch pacing. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Paul Foley, uh, who is uh, very experienced uh, in planter in both CRT and emerging uh, conducting tissue um, uh, pacing. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Marek uh, Njatreski, uh, who will talk to us about his experience uh, with handling leads and using catheters and uh, really the nitty gritty as to how to perform uh, left bundle branch area uh, pacing. So I would like to welcome Paul to uh, give us an overview of conduct, uh, conduction system pacing. Thank you. Thank you, Paco, and uh, it's a great honor to give this talk. And thank you for the welcome. So I'm talking about perspectives on conduction system pacing, by which obviously we refer to his bundle and left conducting system pacing. And there are obviously three main indications for pacing. Uh, bradycardia, those patients with heart failure who need cardiac resynchronization devices, and patients who need defibrillators. And often those uh, indications, uh, more than one indication is, is present in, in the patients. So where does physiological pacing come in? Uh, the first major indication where it could be considered is atrioventricular block. And patients with very pronounced first degree AV block may experience right ventricular pacing even in the face of algorithms designed to minimize it because the AV block is so prolonged. In patients with two to one and complete AV block or those patients who've had an AV mode ablation, these patients expect to have a very high burden of right ventricular pacing. And we know that can be associated with pacing induced cardiomyopathy. There's also a group of patients who've had left ventricular leads implanted and these, uh, for whatever reason, aren't working. So that may be because they can't get there with anatomical constraints, it may be the threshold is high, or another problem is obviously uh, phrenic nerve pacing. And so in this situation, physiological pacing can serve as sort of bailout strategy. And lastly, um, left ventricular and right ventricular pacing is well established in randomized clinical trials, but there are a number of studies comparing biventricular pacing with physiological pacing, suggesting similar outcomes in terms of left ventricle remodeling or possibly better remodeling and a narrow QRS. And this is an area of uh, active study, uh, but still at present the major uh, guidelines would suggest for patients with heart failure and left bundle branch block, these patients should have CRT. So is right ventricular pacing a problem? Well, we talked about uh, uh, pacing induced cardiomyopathy, which occurs in approximately 20% of patients. And this is a very nice study from Puga's group in the United States, where one hospital undertook normal right ventricular apical based pacing, and the other hospital undertook his bundle of pacing. And what they saw was a, a reduction in the primary endpoint of heart death, heart failure hospitalization, or upgrading to biventricular pacing by around 30%. And in fact, if you looked at those patients receiving over 40% right ventricular uh, apical pacing, there was a significant reduction in the risk of heart failure hospitalization, which was even present if you looked at those patients receiving only 20%. Now, obviously for patients, there are options in terms of, uh, instead of right ventricular apical pacing with leads, and so with leadless pacing and cardiac resynchronization pacing. And, and the other question that arises is how much of a problem is, and uh, how often do upgrades occur? And if we look at the ESC survey from 2019, about 30% of the patients undergoing CRT were actually upgrades from pre-existing right ventricular apical based system. And there's obviously a procedure time associated with that around 90 minutes. Approximately 6% of patients have complications and the pace QRS uh, is actually reasonably broad at 137 milliseconds. So it may be that implanting a physiological based pacing system from the start would reduce the risk of the patient needing an upgrade to right ventricular pacing. Now, this sounds very attractive, but there are challenges. We know the procedure time tends to be longer with physiological based pacing. You need a certain level of implant equipment, often EP systems, although a, a patient, patient analyzer can be used. There's the level of knowledge based on, so you need to understand the signals that are coming back, and particularly that's important uh, when the patient's being followed up. It's very important to select the correct device. 
So if you look at his bundle pacing, the history may be implanted into the atrial port, the right ventricular port, or the left ventricular port. And so the device uh, you select will be important, particularly because you need to avoid ventricular safety pacing for his bundle systems. His bundle pacing itself is associated with slightly higher thresholds, and that can have implications for battery life. The R waves tend to be lower, typically around two millivolts. Uh, there's always a question about will the HV block distal to where the lead is implanted occur later on? You need to be absolutely certain the patient's getting his capture and it's not septal pacing. And at follow up, it, there are um, changes in, in the follow up pattern. So, remote follow up isn't really an option for these patients, and that's uh, obviously an important consideration at the moment during COVID. Uh, auto capture does not work. And as we said, ventricular safety pacing uh, for his bundle systems isn't applicable. And the numbers of patients involved in the trials, about uh, 1,438 published cases, uh, largest series of 304, but no major randomized clinical trials. Left bundle branch pacing, which Marek is going to talk about shortly, uh, again, it's very important to get the correct position. Is slightly more attractive in terms of thresholds tend to be a lot lower, so uh, analogous to right ventricular atrial pacing, and the R wave sensing is normal uh, R wave. But there is the attendant risk of perforation, and the numbers of patients implanted in, in uh, case reports and case series around 530, the largest series being so far 100, and again, no randomized clinical trials in, in this area. Now, we talked about the looking at the signals. There is a level of precision uh, which uh, is required for physiological pacing, which is beyond that for right ventricular atrial based pacing. So, this is the first schematic on the left. You see the output on the y axis and the four different positions where there are multiple different thresholds that can be obtained. And that's important during follow up to be aware of what you're, uh, what you're seeing and also at the time of implantation. Marek has done some uh, very impressive work on looking at program stimulation to confirm that you're in the HIS bundle rather than the myocardium. So there's fatigability when the HIS bundle is stimulated, but not seen when the myocardium is stimulated with extra stimuli. And there are various morphological features, which again, it's very important to be sure that the, um, the lead is in the correct position, because actually it can be quite hard to differentiate between non-selective his bundle capture and myocardial capture. So you're looking for a very steep um, uh, peak uh, for non-selective capture rather than a, a slight plateau with myocardial capture. The absence of a notch in V1 in the S wave and also the QRS duration should be narrow. So moving on to uh, left um, conducting system pacing, which Marek is going to talk about, Again, the same position is required. So uh, this is a lead. So the lead in these schematics, one is in the left conducting system, the other is in the left ventricular septum. And you can see the QRS morphology is very similar and the um, uh, QRS duration is, is the same. But when high fidelity mapping is undertaken in the patients where the non-selective left conducting system is stimulated, the Purkinje activation is prior to the QRS. And that's shown in the red arrows. Whereas when it's the um, lead is in the left ventricular septum, stimulating left conducting system, the Purkinje fibers are within the QRS onset. And the left ventricular activation time is shorter if you're in the left conducting system rather than the left ventricular septum. And this is just to say that there is a level of complexity uh, to physiological pacing, which is greater than that with standard right ventricular atrial pacing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That's a very nice overview. Uh, this is clearly very exciting from the uh, scientific point of view. Uh, it's very early days, but, but it is really very encouraging and, and opens up a whole lot of new questions, I think, as well. I think from the clinical point of view, um, there is a great excitement as to uh, whether this is superior to right ventricular pacing. I agree with you that there is some data out there to show that right ventricular pacing is detrimental, um, but I, I do wonder whether this is due uh, to an underlying cardiomyopathy. Uh, I think that if you look at right ventricular pacing in a completely healthy ventricle, 
I don't, I can't see anything from the literature to confidently say that right ventricular pacing is detrimental. Um, but yes, of course, we all see patients who uh, have a right ventricular pacing induced cardiomyopathy. Um, I think obviously uh, this is something that I'm sure Marek will, will, will cover. Um, uh, there are slight uh, worries uh, about the fact that we are dealing with imperfect technology and immature technology at the moment. Um, and there's clearly a need to work on both the devices and the leads and um, in my experience also um, the catheters, the guiding catheters and the um, wires and various other things. So without um, um, uh, and discussing any more, I'd like to welcome Professor Marek uh, Njotreski uh, who will take us through left bundle um, branch pacing. Thank you, Marek. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Um, my task is to um, tell you in a few words how to do left bundle branch pacing. This is a very new te technique and I do not claim that I have all the answers and I know how to do it best. Every operator has a slightly different approach, sometimes quite different approach, and I'm not claiming mine is the best, but this is, I will just share with you the experience that I have. The first left bundle branch pacemaker that I've implanted was always almost two years ago. Since that time in my lab, we have implanted over 300 such devices. So that gives me certain room um, uh, where I can move uh, the experience that I have that I can share with you. And because of the time frame, I have decided to break down this complex procedure into four simple steps. So, um, uh, Okay, these are my moderate disclosures and let's move to, the, to, this, to these four steps. So I think the whole procedure uh, rests on four pillars. First, you need to identify the target area on the mid septum. You need to know how to get there and where it is. Then you need to learn how to screw the lead. It is very important. It's not a simple task like you have with active fixation lead where you just do a few rotation and, and that's it. You need to know how to interpret responses to a lead rotation because that's crucial to success. We'll talk about that. Then you need to monitor the lead depth during screwing to prevent overscrewing because if you do, go too deep, you will end in the left ventricle, and that's something we don't want to. So that's, a, again, a very important step of the procedure. And then the final step that has been uh, very important for me from the scientific point of view, because we published a lot about that, is to how to confirm that the acute endpoint of the procedure was actually achieved. Uh, how to confirm left bundle branch capture, because it's not like just RV procedure, you implant, you have a capture and that's it. No, you need to confirm that you capture the structure that you are interested in, that is conduction system. Okay, so let's go to the uh, uh, step one, uh, the target area, where it is. So the target area is on the septum and uh, it's close to the his bundle area marked with the red dot. It's close to the tricuspid annulus, uh, marked with this yellow line. It's pretty vast area. Actually, the area that I marked is perhaps bigger than most operators would agree. The best part is close to the his, one, two centimeters from the his, that's the proximal left bundle. But sometimes it's more difficult to get there than to the other parts of the arborization of left bundle. And I do not hesitate to use those areas. So very often we go slightly more apical and slightly more inferior to get the left bundle and the cures obtained from, thought, from those areas are also excellent. So how do you know on the floor where that area is? Well, you can use the, the, the contrast as you see in this picture in the middle of the slide, but I use that very, very rarely. Actually, a good implanter knows where the tricuspid ring is, judging by the movement of the sheath, looking at the endocardial <coughs> potential, V potential and the HL potential, and sometimes you see the his potential. So you also know where is the upper part of the tricuspid ring and that's enough. 
You don't need to use the contrast. You Most of the time, you don't need to even identify the HIS to know what the left bundle branch area is. Just the tricuspid ring is the perfect anatomical marker. How to get there? We do not have dedicated tools, uh, as you have heard a moment ago, but we still have our tools that are not that bad. We use the sheath, the HIS sheath from the Select Secure family from Medtronic, which is designed for HIS, but it also directs you very well on the septum because of this second septal curve. And that's enough to get the left bundle in majority of cases. Sometimes when there is unfavorable anatomy, the rotation of the heart that somehow makes this sheath not very useful, I use the S10 delivery catheter, which uh, allows us to um, target the slightly more inferior septum and the septum that is slightly uh, more rotated than usually. But we definitely need a different sheath. My IBL sheath would be uh, would have slightly bigger diameter inside, in, in bigger lumen, would be more sturdy, because the the obstacle to implantation is is the kinking, and uh, if you have to rotate the, the sheath very strongly, it prevents the leak, free leak movement inside, and that's the biggest obstacle to implant the the lead in difficult anatomies. The second market and you, uh, uh, the second tool that you use to define your target area is the ECG that you see on the uh, right part of the slide. And uh, when you choose your target area, judging by a uh, floor or image, then you do the initial pace mapping and you, you, you analyze the paste QRS. And this paste QRS should be compatible with the mid septal area. That is the polarity of the QRS in lead two and lead three should be discordant. Lead two should be always positive while lead three should always have some negative component. I'm not saying it should be completely negative like in this example, but it should have a negative component and that's a perfect position. If you pay attention to lead V1, you will see this famous notch at the nadio and that's a good thing to have, but it's not obligatory. Another thing that you sometimes observe is uh, that the QRS, like you can appreciate in lead V4, V5, is already quite nice. It's slightly more narrow than in other areas. I don't know why is that. Maybe this is some distant capture of the left bundle already, or maybe this is some kind of non-selective his capture, but this QRS is nicer. And that's the perfect spot to screw the lead inside the septum. If you have this fluoro, this ECG, you just go to the next step. And this next step is to rotate the lead. And uh, here I have to go to one of the studies that we published on left bundle branch pacing. And that study came out of our need two years ago when, it, when we did start this procedure, I was puzzled why sometimes it is so easy to achieve left bundle branch pacing, just a few rotations and it's done. And sometimes you fight and fight and have problems. Sometimes the lead will not progress. You, you, you rotate the lead, you see the torque build up in the lead as you see in the you know, inferior right uh, part of the slide. The lead is completely, uh, is, is, is the torque is there. You see the force of your rotations there and they do not transmit to the heart. Why is that? Uh, and sometimes the, the, the torque, the tension immediately transmits itself to the heart. So we did this cadaver model. Uh, in this model, we used fresh heart from freshly deceased people, suicide uh, victims, car accident victims. We used the same lead, the 3830 model, and we used the same delivery sheet and the same uh, operator was ha handling, ensuring that the pressure, the, the support was more or less the same as during real life procedure. And we observed three types of responses, two types of effects. And actually they resemble very, very much what we did observe during real life procedures. So the first uh, response effect was the thing we call entanglement effect. You can't progress because the endocardium wraps around the helix, around the lead and prevents pr uh, progression of the lead inside the septum. You're, if you have a, such response that the, your torque does not transmit my advice is not to fight with that position. You have to find another position. That was a very common response observed on, on the cadaver model. 
but it's also observed in real life. The second response is you rotate the lead, you see the torque build up and it's released. So it goes inside of the heart, but there is no change in the QRS. On fluoro, you see no lead movement. And most likely you have a drill response, drill effect. You are just moving in the same position and drilling a hole in the septum. This is a bad thing because firstly, you will not get to the left bundle. And secondly, the lead and the myocardium are very loosely connected and it, it might dislodge later on. The, the response, the effect that we look for is the screwdriver effect. You rotate and each rotation after initial torque buildup is transmitted to the heart and actually results in a deeper and deeper position of the lead. That's the, um, the kind of response that we want. But at the same time, this is the kind of response that is also risky because um, you can overscrew, you can end in the left ventricle. So that makes us go, uh, once you understand these responses, you need to differentiate actually between the screwdriver and the drill because both behave the same in your hands. Both result in the transmission of the torque. The difference you can observe and differentiate between this, the difference you can differentiate these two by looking at the ECG and fluoro. And this is what we will um, uh, discuss in the next slide. So how to differentiate between these two responses and how to ensure that you do not end as this one of these two leads that you see on our cadaver model that went so smoothly through the septum that it ended in the left ventricle how to stop at the subendocardial layer close to the left ventricle, but not in the left ventricle. And the, uh, the, 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 the mainstay technique is pace mapping. The pace mapping, uh, the perfect thing would be to have constant pace mapping while screwing. Uh, for this, we need some kind of revolving adapter that you could connect the external pacemaker with the distal pin of the lead. Unfortunately, with the, the manufacturers, the industry still does not produce a thing like that. I have modified uh, several shock alligator clips to produce a kind of revolving tool um, that would uh, uh, enable a, a, a continuous pace mapping while the lead progresses inside the septum, but they are all far from being perfect. So I rely mainly on interrupted pacing. But here, uh, this ECG was taken from a patient where continuous pacing was done while the lead progresses. And it is very, very important to be familiar with the change of the pace QRS patterns. You start with this pattern on the left, where you see broad QRS, notched QRS, and in V1, you can appreciate in this red uh, circle that there is a notch at the median. When you get deeper, the QRS should change. And that's the difference between the uh, screwdriver effect and the uh, drill response because in the drill response, the QRS will not change. Here it changes and you see that the, the notch in V1 disappears. The QRS becomes slightly more spiky, slightly more smooth. You add one or two more rotations and then you see that the QRS is very spiky. And at the end of the QRS in V1, slight R prime appears. If you add still few more rotations, you will observe that the big R um, at the end of the QRS is present and you have full blown right bundle branch block pattern in V1. And that's the QRS that you like. And this is the moment you stop. Once you have a QRS that is compatible with left bundle branch capture, that is nice, it's um, smooth, it's narrow. That's the way uh, to know that you should stop. And that still is the mainstay technique to to prevent overscrewing. You either do it continuously or more commonly uh, in an interrupted fashion. After a few rotations, you check the QRS, you add more rotations or not. That's the best thing uh, uh, that we have. And some people will tell you that the monitoring impedance is important. I never did that. 300 cases, no monitoring of impedance, and it works. So I don't think that's really necessary. Paste QRS morphology is the best. However, right now I rely a little bit more on the thing that you see here. I call um, these screw bits of, um, uh, when you go with the lead deep inside the septum, you irritate the tissues and this irritation causes premature complexes. Uh, and if you look at them, for example, this is a classical example of a shower of premature bits from the septum. You will see that in this patient with left bundle branch QRS, suddenly, a QRS appears with R 
at the end of the keywords in D1. These are gross, and in the middle, you see a keyword that is completely right bundle branch mod, mor, mor, morphology, which is exactly the indication that you want to have that your lead tip, the helix, is irritating the subendocardial layer on the left side. And that's the perfect indication that you should stop turning. That's the only actually tool that I very often use right now. You do rotations, you observe, you look for screw bits. If you have them, you don't need to have anything more because if, when you start face mapping at that moment, you will have a QRS morphology, which will be identical to your last screw bit. And that's the information that if you don't have them, you need to add more screws. If you have them, you need to stop to prevent overscrewing, to, you, to prevent uh, perforation. So the screw beads are the way to go for me right now and interrupted or continuous face mapping is another uh, uh, way to prevent um, overscrewing. And uh, of course you have other tools, the fluoro and the endocardial signal from the pacing link to prevent um, uh, going too deep. Especially LAO is very, very useful. On LAO, you directly see the progression of the lead. And if you are not sure if you have a, a screwdriver response or um, a drill response from your lead, uh, LAO will tell you the truth because in the drill response, there is no movement of the lead to the left. While in the screwdriver, each rotation will move slightly the lead tip to the left. So LAO is 30 is obligatory during implantation, especially in difficult cases when you do not get the left bundle during your first attempt. Another thing is to look for the left bundle uh, potential on the lead, because if it's there, it's again a proof that you are in the subendocardial layer because that's the only area where you can record it. So you, when you have left bundle potential or Parkinji potential, that's again an indicator to stop, absolutely stop uh, screwing because if you do not, if you will go to look for a nicer potential, your chances of perforation are skyrocketing. Uh, when it comes to left bundle branch potential, it is very important to recognize it, not only when it's nice, big, and almost like his potential, but also recognize it when it's small, like here on the uh, far right, when you see a potential that is not much bigger than the artifact level, it's already a good sign and you need a clean signal for this. Very often the potential, even when it's big, is completely buried with the v, in the V potential, as you see in the middle example. Uh, this is because there's a kind of injury and the kind of injury somehow merges the left bundle potential and the ventricular potential into one complex. You need to uh, be able to see the potential inside. Uh, you see a similar situation on the, on the left where the potential is moderate, but again, linked with the V potential by the kind of injury. And the trick to uh, see that is to measure the potential to QRS, to see that this is not a QRS. It starts much before the QRS, you know this is a potential. Okay, so okay, when so you um, are there, uh, you need to uh, finalize the procedure with the fourth step, the step to confirm that you have left bundle branch capture. The mainstay technique for this, known from the his bundle uh, arena, was the differential output maneuver. Just go down with the output or go up with the output. I want to observe the change in QRS morphology. This is based on very simple premise that there is a difference in capture threshold between the myocardium and the conduction system. And yes, you can use that technique. In my experience, this technique works only in 22% of the cases. In all other cases, the thresholds are equal. Uh, when it works, it looks like that. The QRS on the right, on this example on the right, you see non-selective QRS that transitions into selective QRS. In D1, there's an obvious change from small R, sometimes almost absent R, to full-blown right bundle branch block pattern. On the left, you see myocardial response when the non-selective QRS transitions into broader QRS, that still has in V1 a kind of right bundle branch morphology, but it's much broader, sometimes notched, and this is loss of uh, conduction system capture and you have only myocardial capture. Even if you have this response during the procedure, it will not be there next day. 
the thresholds will be almost, almost, almost always equal. And this is why you need a different technique to confirm um, that you have reached your endpoint, the, um, uh, the capture of the left bundle. And for this, we are using, in every case, programmed deep septal stimulation. The technique that we developed last year and published in the GC uh, is, in my opinion, necessary in the vast majority of cases. It's also based on very simple uh, uh, premise that there is a difference in, in refractoriness between myocardial tissue and conducting, conducting system in between left bundle and the adjacent myocardium. And even if there are no differences or the differences are small, you can produce the differences by using different pacing techniques. Here you see in the lower example, a uh, classic drive, 600 milliseconds drive, and then a premature um, that you will find the uh, left bundle refractory and myocardium responsive, and you will see a change in QS morphology from in V1 from right bundle to left bundle type. That means you have lost left bundle. And this is a proof that you had left bundle to begin with, and this is a response to this diagnostic of uh, reaching the endpoint. You will see that the QRS will change from uh, narrow and uh, short time to peak in V6 to long time in, 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 um, uh, to, to peak in V6. You will see all many different morphological changes. And uh, much nicer response, also diagnostic, is a selective response. For example, here, how did we get the selective response this, despite sometimes that the refractoriness of the left bundle is longer? How is that possible? Is it possible by using a different pacing protocols? For example, here, a very long cycle length of the intrinsic rhythm makes the refractoriness of the uh, uh, myocardial tissue quite long. And then you provide first premature, which shortens the refractoriness, but only of the left bundle, not of the myocardium, because the myocardium needs many cycles to shorten the refractoriness, while the conduction system needs just one cycle to shorten the refractoriness. So the next premature will find the myocardium refractory and left bundle responsive, and you will have a selective response with this typical full-blown right bundle branch block pattern, the shovel-like uh, deflection instead of small deflection at the end of the one and you will have a selective response, which is a very elegant way to prove that you have a left bundle branch block capture. So uh, that technique we use, uh, if it's not working, because sometimes you cannot really see the difference in refractoriness, then we use more advanced pacing protocols. And you see an example of that here. We publish that in GC. For example, here you see a fast drive, then a pose to increase the refractoriness of the left bundle, and then myocardial response. Um, we do not have time to go into details, uh, but uh, it's based in very simple physiology that you should know if you want to be uh, uh, successful in using program stimulation for left bundle branch pacing. And once you have that, once you have confirmation of left bundle branch capture, that's the end of it. All you need to do right now is to put the device into the pocket, close the incision, and go home because rest is a quite standard procedure. So that's the way I do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marek. That was excellent. Uh, it's brilliant to have that sort of insight into, into left bundle branch uh, area pacing. Um, some questions. I mean, I, I actually, I tend to use the steerable catheter uh, by default, actually. I find that it gives you more support. Uh, I put the 035 wire through the um, through the guide and get into the right ventricle uh, very easily uh, and then remove the wire and then I can use contrast. Now, I, I, I find contrast useful actually. Um, so as you're screwing the lead, you can use a little bit of contrast uh, in the steerable catheter that will give you, uh, will, will tell you um, that you're uh, the, the, about the distance between your opposition to the septum and how far the lead has gone through, particularly on the LAO. Um, I also find that, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, th this, uh, 
these procedures are done as a redo, as you know, a salvage procedure, and you have to go from the right. I often also find that this steerable is, um, is good. What are your thoughts about the steerable rather than the pre-shaped? I would love to have a steerable sheet that is good enough to use it. Uh, the, the sheet that has um, a separate uh, curve as apart from the RV curve. Uh, we do not have that. We have only 304 uh, that we use occasionally for the his bundle facing the steerable. We do not have the steerable with the second curve, the septal curve, which is uh, available in some countries, but uh, not in Poland. And I do not have experience with that. Certainly the future um, uh, belongs to the steerable sheet. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Paul, what's your um, experience with the steerable rather than the pre-shaped? I tend to use the pre-shaped catheter as the um, uh, first choice and usually gone to the steerable where we've had difficulties. So um, I think it's just what I'm familiar with. I'm, I was interested in Marek's comment about the screw beads and, and just wondered how often you see those, Marek, when you're doing left bundle implantation. Well, uh, at the beginning, when I was not looking at them actively, I just observed them from time to time. But right now, I'm uh, actually doing a research on that. And I have to tell you that it's present in over 90% of the cases and in nearly 100% of the successful sites. So it's always there. If you don't see screw bits, the chances that you are there are very small. On the other hand, when you see them, this is 100% certain that you are there. So they are always there. Look at your procedures. If you have them recorded, look at them. You will be surprised that we are, they were always there. Sometimes one bit that you missed, but it was there. Also, Marek, the, the other question is scar. So some authors have uh, placed some hope uh, in the um, in the notion that we can circumvent scar with uh, left bundle branch area pacing or even his pacing as opposed to CRT, which as you know, there is some evidence to show that if you pace uh, scar, it's, um, it's uh, suboptimal. But actually uh, pacing a septal scar, which is very common, particularly in patients who have had a NLAD infarct, um, it, it's, all, it's likely to be also uh, a problem. Uh, do you have any views about SCAR in relation to uh, positions uh, or the screwing or the stability? I'm not sure what causes the entanglement effect. It's why sometimes you can't really progress with the lead. And I think that apart from some kind of, I don't know, panzer endocardium, the SCAR might be the answer. If you have a very fibrous scar, scar on the septum, you may not be able to progress with the lead. And then you need to go slightly deeper to find the area where you can go deep into the septum. Do not find with a very dense scar. But if you go into the scar, and I think I did that a few times, then you might be surprised that the QRS is very ugly. You are on the left side and you are not happy with the QRS because they simply know uh, alive conducting tissue and you are capturing some a few myofibers that are there but the QRS is poor and if you go further down the road you will have a nicer QRS actually mm -hmm. that's the, the, my observation you know these few cases where I did this. So Marek uh, with uh, Brady pacing uh, how, how, uh, how are you um, dealing with this are you putting a, an RV leading as well? or two leads, or are you just leaving the, the, the uh, left bundle lead? Well, I, my lab completely converted to conduction system pacing. We do not do RV pacing for any indication apart as a bailout for if everything else fails. So we start with the his, we don't play with it too long. If it's not there, we just go for the left bundle and finish the procedure. And all procedures, regardless of the indication, is it CRT, heart failure, or just sick sinus or AV block, will receive a conduction system pacing. Even the youngest residents uh, who did, that did start this year, pacemaker implantation, they do not learn the classic technique. They only do conduction system pacing. It can be done by inexperienced operators. It's a technique that is quite easy, actually. Mm -hmm. So no, no, RV pay, no RV leads to answer your question. No, no. RV leads classic. No. And Paul, what's your practice? 
Uh, currently, we are doing a fair amount of his bundle replacing uh, for um, patients with first degree AV block or, or narrow QS um, complete heart block. Uh, but we're still, I, I guess, waiting for randomized clinical trials to be absolutely certain that um, we, it is the right thing to do for every patient. Are you worried about uh, pacemaker dependency in these patients? In the patients who are having his bundle system, uh, I mean, that, that is a potential problem. We always check that we have one-to-one -one conduction uh, when we um, uh, when we pace at high outputs, uh, high, sorry, at um, high rates, um, and we check the HV interval. Well, I think um, this has been uh, very helpful. Um, I, I, it, it's a very nice exposition of the technique. I'm very grateful to uh, Professor Jaroszewski and to uh, Dr. Paul Foley for this session, which I, fi I hope that you find uh, um, very useful. I certainly did. Many thanks. Bye-bye.